Certainly good to see so many uh, folks here today. My name is Ed Hartman. I'm DAB's Inspector General, and uh, thank you for coming and spending about the next hour and a half with me to uh, talk about our Constitution and bylaws and how we can improve communications and activities at the chapter level as well as the department. As we um, begin today, um, I'd like to put our mission statement up on the screen. The reason I do that is because I want to remind everybody of what our mission statement is because so many times we get together at different activities, whether it's at the department level or the chapter level, and it seems like we start discussing things that have absolutely no place in DAV. So I like to, uh, anytime I get a chance, talk about our mission statement, and certainly that holds true today. So as we discuss activities and how we can improve communications and operations with our, within our chapter or department, it's certainly helpful if we remind ourselves every opportunity that we can uh, of our mission statement. Of course, we are dedicated to a, one single purpose, and that's empowering veterans to lead high quality lives with respect and dignity. We accomplish this by making sure veterans and their families can access the full range of benefits available to them, fighting for the interests of America's injured heroes on Capitol Hill, and educating the public about the great sacrifices and needs of veterans transitioning back to civilian life. How do we do that? First and foremost, providing free professional assistance to veterans and their families in obtaining benefits and services earned through military service and provided by the Department of Veterans Affairs and other agencies of the government. Providing outreach concerning our programs, services to the American people generally and to disabled veterans and their families specifically. Representing the interests of disabled veterans and their families, their widowed spouses and their orphans before Congress, the White House, the judicial branch, as well as state and local governments. Extending DAV's mission of hope into the communities where these veterans and their families live through a network of state level departments and local chapters and providing a structure through which disabled veterans can express their compassion for their fellow veterans through a variety of volunteer programs. The reason I mention that is of course as I uh, indicated earlier uh, when we go about our business at any DAV activity, whether it's a chapter meeting, department meeting, we have to keep those um, bullet points uh, in mind as we discuss different activities because at the end of the day, if our discussions aren't centered around that mission statement and the programs that we provide, then we have absolutely no reason to be discussing anything other than that mission statement. So. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the structures of chapters, departments, what makes them effective, what the roles and responsibilities are of certain officers within the chapter. And as you can see, uh, at uh, the chapter department level, uh, obviously we all have commanders, we all have senior vice commanders. Depending upon the size of our chapter department, we at least have one junior vice commander and up to four. Of course, we have the most important individual uh, within the chapter, and that's the person that makes everything happen. That's the adjutant, the treasurer, and the judge advocate. And uh, in preparing uh, just a few minutes ago, I realized that I have some comments that I need to address uh, a little later with regard to the chaplain. Uh, many times uh, people misunderstand the role and the purpose of the chaplain, so uh, when we get uh, a little further into the program, I'll certainly address some of the highlighted uh, responsibilities and roles of the chaplain as well. So the commander, of course, uh, the commander is, is certainly the leader, if you will, of the chapter or department, and of course is elected annually by the body to serve as the spokesperson for the organization. Uh, the commander is not one to uh, provide guidance uh, dictate what the chapter is going to do, bark orders, but in essence, he's a leader, he or she's a leader, someone that's able to uh, conduct a business session of a chapter or department, uh, provide some guidance as, as uh, it relates to uh, 
disputes that might occur within the chapter department level um, and is typically the chairman of all the committees either in the chapter or the department. You need to have someone who's a, a negotiator, if you will, someone who has a voice of reason because at the end of the day, uh, the chapter commander is responsible for everything that happens within the chapter or within the department. That means controlling the activities of the body. Many times I go to a chapter or department and you walk in and it's a business session and all you hear is three or four people arguing against one another and the commander sitting up here allowing it to happen. Of course, as we all know, as members of DAB, we have to first be recognized by the chair or the commander in order to speak. Um, when the uh, commander recognizes the individual, that individual speaks. If somebody else has something to say, they wait until that individual is done speaking, then they're going to have an opportunity to speak. But in no way, shape, or form should we find ourselves at any level, chapter, department, or national organization, where we have a body or a group of people that are just arguing back and forth. And nine times out of ten, there are arguments that absolutely have nothing to do with our mission statement, so therefore shouldn't even be brought up before the body. So. When you look to elect a commander of a chapter or department, again, you should really look to find someone who has a voice of reason, someone who is stern and has no problem calling someone out of order and making sure that the topics that are addressed within the body are relevant to our mission statement. Because uh, as I said, I oftentimes go into a chapter or department uh, meeting and we're talking about things that pertain to another organization or something completely outside the scope of our federally chartered purpose. And most importantly, again, the commander is elected to uh, serve as the members of the chapter or the department desire. So uh, the chapter commander or the department commander doesn't have the unilateral decision to make any decisions of the chapter or the department, but rather carries out the wants, wishes, and desires of the body. Senior Vice Commander is um, obviously the individual that would serve in the absence of the commander of the chapter department if uh, the commander is not able to attend and participate, and is usually the chairman of the membership committee. Uh, many department bylaws, chapter bylaws that we review and look at uh, stipulates that the Senior Vice Commander will be the membership chairperson. What does that mean? That means that they're solely responsible for increasing the uh, number of members and encouraging part-life members to pay off their membership and become full-life members of the organization, of the chapter and of the department. Um, and of course may serve as the chairman of other committees and most importantly stays engaged and uh, continues to learn from the current commander and from the chapter or the department so that if and when it's their time to serve as commander they're a little bit more prepared to do so. Um, when we talk about recruitment, many times um, when reviewing chapter or department bylaws, it stipulates that the membership chairman, and in most cases the senior vice commander, in addition to being responsible for recruiting and retaining members, also uh, gives the reference to uh, serving as the individual responsible for reviewing eligibility to membership. Obviously in, in uh, chapters and departments, actually not departments, but in, in chapters, if a new member comes to the organization, has a completed application form, there's no right or obligation for the chapter to have a review committee to validate an individual's eligibility. That's what our membership department's for, because many times, uh, we'll find that a member wants to join and is certainly eligible, but for some reason uh, uh, there's a dispute between that individual and the member that's serving as the membership chairman and uh, will recommend that this member not be eligible for membership when certainly they have every right and opportunity to. So all applications should be submitted to national headquarters for review and validation. The only time that the chapter has the ability to vote on a uh, member joining their chapter is as it relates to transfers. So certainly no chapter wants to inherit the, you know, the baggage or the dirty laundry from another chapter. So if you're aware of an individual who's been a member and a problem in, you know, chapter 110, 
Um, and certainly they've uh, kind of driven him out of the organization. The last thing that you want to inherit in your chapter is his continued problems. So in those cases, the chapter certainly has the opportunity and the right to vote on whether or not they'll accept that member or not. Junior vice commanders, whether it's one to four, uh, but every chapter, every department must have at least one. Serves uh, as the senior vice commander in the absence of the senior vice, most typically will be responsible for chairing VAVS, fundraising activities of the chapter or the department, and uh, again, stays engaged and learns from their predecessors so that if and when they're able to be elevated, they will be ready for uh, what lies ahead in the future. Also very important that they mentor members as well. Um, you know, we're only as good as our weakest links, so it's our responsibility to, when we have members come in, especially new members, that we teach them about DAV, teach them about the different programs that we have, uh, encourage them to take up leadership positions, and certainly not every member in DAV is, uh, would make a good commander, not every member would make a good adjutant, not every member would make a good treasurer. But it's up to us as leaders in DAV to identify with those new members, identify their strong points, and try to guide them into the appropriate position that will best serve the DAV and will allow them to feel a part and engaged in DAV, whether it's at the chapter level or the department level. The adjutant. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the adjutant is really the go-to person, the individual responsible for making everything happen in the chapter or the department. Uh, they should be viewed as the CEO of the body, whether it's a chapter or department, um, and are responsible for serving as a secretary for all meetings. They handle all the correspondence uh, and ensures that all the reports, whether it's a chapter officer report or an annual financial report, are completed and submitted to national headquarters or the department headquarters appropriately. As I mentioned earlier, not everybody's cut out to be an adjutant or commander. So in an adjutant, you want to look for someone who is in, uh, uh, able to eff uh, effectively communicate. They're very organized. You know, they keep track of everything. They're able to take good notes, keep good minutes. Um, so they're the ones who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the department and in some cases chapters depending upon the size of the chapter. As we all know, commanders are elected every year and hopefully, ideally, you're going to have an adjutant who remains in that position year after year after year to continue the continuity. They have the knowledge, the understanding, they know what's been done in recent years. So it's not very effective just because the chapter's bylaws or the department's bylaws allow for the department commander or the chapter commander to appoint a member as the adjutant. It might not be in the best interest of the chapter or the department if a commander is elected and because they have a very good friend in Bob that I'm going to appoint Bob as my adjutant for the year. That should be the last thing that happens. If you have a very good, strong, organized adjutant, uh, we strongly encourage you to continue that person in that capacity so that there's continuity in programs and services throughout the coming years. So in my mind, the adjutant is certainly the most impor uh, important individual and member within the chapter or department. The treasurer. It uh, should be considered as the chief financial officer of the body. They're responsible for providing timely and accurate financial reports at every meeting. And we're going to talk in pretty good depth about uh, finances here um, coming up here shortly. But they're responsible for providing those financial reports at every meeting of the chapter or of the department. Uh, they also ensure that the distributions of the body, whether it be a chapter department, are provided by the wants, wishes, and desires of the membership. And again, they're not uh, responsible, they're not permitted, they're not able to 
write checks, make payments that have not already been authorized by the chapter. So uh, you really have to pay attention to the finances of the chapter all throughout the course of the month. That's why it's so very important for we as members of DAV at the chapter level and at the department uh, require, demand that at every meeting we have a financial report from the treasurer that clearly outlines the income and expenditures of the body over the last month. Uh, most importantly, must be trustworthy. Uh, there are many opportunities in DAV for money to walk away. And as I mentioned before, uh, not everybody's cut out to be a treasurer. Not everybody's the most trustworthy. We oftentimes get calls from chapters or departments after the fact when an individual has been elected or appointed as treasurer and then the body finds out two months later by way of a simple Google search of the individual's name that they just got out of prison five months ago for embezzlement. Certainly not the guy you want keeping your books, all right? So got to be somebody that's trustworthy, trustworthy, ethical, and can be trusted and organized as well because at the, at the end of the day, we don't want a treasurer who, come to find out, can't even manage, balance, and take care of their own personal finances, let alone the finances of the chapter of the department. Judge Advocate, um, I can't tell you how many times I've been called by a, a judge advocate who has proclaimed to be the legal advisor of the chapter of the department and makes demands, so on and so forth, uh, and feels that it's their obligation as the judge advocate to uh, review anything and everything uh, to get their legal expertise as to whether or not something should be permitted or not. Quite simply, the judge advocate is the parliamentarian of the body. Um, their sole role is to interpret the constitution and bylaws of the chapter or the department um, and make a recommendation as to their interpretation. If something needs clarification or there's some discussion on what a certain section of the chapter or the department's bylaws means, uh, it's the responsibility of the, of the judge advocate to make an opinion as to what it is that uh, they believe is the interpretation, make that recommendation to the commander, and then the commander can make a ruling as to whether or not he or she agrees with that. Very important for a judge advocate to be knowledgeable not only of their own body's bylaws, but all of those constitution and bylaws above them. So if you're a chapter judge advocate, not only do you have to be knowledgeable of your chapter's constitution and bylaws, but those of the department and then those of the national organization. So again, you want to have someone who is able to make good judgment and uh, has a good, keen understanding of the constitution and bylaws at all levels. Um, and as I mentioned, um, and I don't have a slide on here because it just came up uh, uh, shortly before the, the meeting today, I did not include the chaplain. Um, and I felt that it was important because a lot of people have a belief that the chaplain is the, the preacher, the reverend, the uh, priest of the chapter. And of course, as we all know, DAV is a nonpartisan and non-sectarian organization. Non-sectarian means that we are not a religious organization. Um, we were founded on the principles of having a chaplain as something that's continued throughout the years. Quite simply, the chaplain is the spiritual advisor to the body. Uh, we shouldn't find ourselves in the position of uh, getting into different religions in our prayers prior to and at the end of the meeting. Uh, in addition, the chaplain should certainly be responsible for looking out for the well-being of our members and their families. And again, being the spiritual advisor, but we cannot come to a chapter meeting and start talking about, you know, Jesus or Muhammad or the prophet. Um, you know, we have a long history of being spiritual, and we can still continue to do that by reviewing the DAB rituals. And if you look in the rituals as a chaplain, you'll see that there are suggested prayers for the opening and the closing. Uh, 
It's very generic. It's not specific to any one religion. And unfortunately, from my opinion, we've had more issues in the last couple of years from uh, people who want to be politically correct and call to complain that, well, you know, I'm Muslim and I was at the chapter meeting and I disagree with the chapter commander or the chapter uh, chaplain's uh, reference to Jesus um, or vice versa. Uh, we also have a number of atheists in the organization that take exception to coming to a meeting and yeah, you know, they complain that it seems like a religious ceremony because they keep talking about Jesus and, and uh, God. And um, unfortunately, that's the, that's the environment that we live in today. And when you give people an opportunity to complain about something, you can sure bet they're going to take advantage of the opportunity to complain. So when we gather at our chapter meetings, our department meetings, we would just like to encourage all chaplains to be mindful of that. Be mindful that there are other religions in the um, uh, that uh, do not appreciate it, and obviously, our Constitution, our very founding Constitution in 1920, stipulated that we are non-sectarian. So we have to be very cautious in how we approach religion in chapters and departments. Uh, also, keep in mind uh, if you have a chapter newsletter or a department newsletter. Uh, we strongly encourage that you have an editorial staff that is responsible for not only looking at the grammar and the sentence structure, things of that nature, but also be mindful of the fact that we can include religious uh, uh, citations, you know, verses of the Bible uh, that we see quite often, and I'm comfortable with it, but unfortunately we do have a growing number of members who are not appreciative of that, so we have to be mindful that we can include any scripture in chapter newsletters, department newsletters, online, or at our uh, chapter and department functions. Fundraiser approvals, of course, we all know that we can only operate our service programs and provide assistance to veterans and their families um, with the assistance of donations from the general public. Um, many of the disputes that I, ta I, I hear about and uh, resolve during the course of the year are related to fundraising and most usually it's in large metropolitan areas where there are more than one chapter that are kind of close together and a chapter doesn't understand where their boundaries are, they go outside of their city, <clears throat> excuse me, go outside of their city and start to fundraise in another city. And uh, in other cases, it's in very rural areas where you might have a chapter chartered in a very small, one-light town. But yet five miles away, there's a larger area that has a Walmart. But there's a chapter that is chartered in that city. Um, you know, there's no, there's no way that a smaller chapter can go into another chapter's chartered territory and raise funds there unless they get the permission of the uh, chapter that's chartered in that area, and then that's fine. But uh, most typically, it's a matter of you know, just not knowing the bylaws, knowing where your boundaries are, what your restrictions are. So uh, chapters have to be very, very careful to only solicit funds in their chartered territory. And obviously, if a chapter wants to do any fundraiser, um, they have to get prior approvals of not only the chapter to ensure that that's what the chapter wants to engage in, but must also get the prior approval of the department prior to, prior to conducting the fundraiser. Uh, and quite simply, that's just by way of a ballot to the department executive committee. All fundraising programs, in accordance with our bylaws, must specify what the proceeds from the fundraiser are going to benefit. So in other words, if a chapter is doing a fundraiser, um, you know, a 50-50 raffle or something in their community, where are the proceeds going to go from a, a, that fundraiser? Is it going to go to buy a new van? Is it going to go to uh, provide uh, supplies for the chapter service officer? Is it going to fund the homeless veterans program? So 
doing a fundraiser is certainly a great idea, but we can't just do a fundraiser for the sake of doing a fundraiser. We have to do it for a program that it's going to benefit. Um, all departments, obviously, they know that if the department wishes to engage in a fundraiser of any sort, it must first not only receive the approval of the department executive committee, but also of the national executive committee. And I can tell you that we're pretty efficient and pretty fast in getting those turned around. So if we get a request to uh, approve a department fundraiser, every Thursday we send out ballots to the national executive committee via email for their review and consideration. So if we get a request from a department on Monday, it goes out with the batch on Thursday. And usually by the following Monday, we have a decision by the NEC that we can tell the department yay or nay. So we're very mindful of that. We don't sit on those, so we want to make sure that uh, we give timely consideration to those requests for fundraisers that come in. Forgive me not drives. Um, something that is very um, uh, unique to DAV gives chapters the opportunity to do these fundraisers without any prior approval. So in other words, uh, if a chapter typically conducts their forgive me not drives in the spring or over the 4th of July weekend or on you know over the Veterans Day weekend there's no prior approval that's needed from a chapter to can do or for them to do the forget me not drive and the reason for that is because it's specified in our bylaws that forget me not funds have to be spent on service so we know that if a chapter conducts a forget me not uh, fundraiser that those funds are going to be spent on service the only thing that we do ask is that the chapter notify their department at least seven days in advance of the forget me not drive, uh, where they're going to be, how long they're going to be there, because in this day and age we have so many organizations that are out there trying to raise money in the name of veterans and unfortunately in some cases using our name to purposely try to confuse the public into making them believe that they're with DAV. They know we have a good name, we have a good reputation, so they're going to give to them. So illegal, yes, but that certainly doesn't stop them from doing it. So when the department gets a call from citizens in that area, they can confirm, yes, we know that Chapter 7 is going to be at Walmart this weekend doing the Forget Me Not Drive. They are who they say they are. Um, one thing that um, is not taken advantage of um, as much as I think that it could is, is the department's ability to do fundraisers. When we think, or forget me not drives, when we talk about forget me not drives, we typically think of chapters going out in the community and you know, selling the forget me not flowers and, and soliciting do, uh, donations from the general public. Departments certainly have every right to go into communities that are not served by DAV chapters and do fundraising uh, in those areas over a Forget Me Not Drive. Um, so again, that opportunity is there. Uh, it's just a matter of trying to identify leaders and, and officers of the department to physically go out into those communities that are not serviced by a DAV chapter and solicit funds in those uh, parts of the country to benefit the department. And, as, and again, as I highlighted at the very bottom there, and this is very, very important, which is why approvals are not needed for Forget Me Not Drives, is that every penny that comes in for a Forget Me Not Drive must be used solely for the purpose of providing service to disabled veterans and their families. Golden Crown Military Appreciation Monday events. Um, this is another program that uh, come 1st of November, we start getting a lot of phone calls about. Uh, they increase until the end of November, end of December, because you know folks are trying to figure out where the money is, who gets what, what's the money supposed to be used for. Um, I can tell you that DAV's maintained a relationship with Golden Crown for many years, and it first generated as a, uh, the Military Appreciation Monday where Golden Corral would give free dinner to veterans that uh, come in on Veterans Day. That grew uh, a few years afterwards to allow departments to come in and actually do fundraising over the course of that weekend. 
Uh, so as a result of that, the national organization created a relationship with Golden Corral and created the opportunity for Military Appreciation Monday, which is intended to be a department fundraising program because you know when it's all said and done there are very few opportunities really for a department to do fundraising unless they take it upon themselves to actively go out and do some kind of a fundraising activity I think that most of our departments just rely on um, uh, certain percentage of proceeds that come in from chapter fundraisers they you know rely on the membership dues per capita the, the uh, funds that come from the national organization from the department fundraising program but certainly this is an opportunity for departments to uh, raise funds so that they can continue to support the department programs which are usually the HSC program the VANS VAVS and the department service officer program however there are many golden corrals throughout the state so they can't do it by themselves so they turn to the chapters ask for the chapters to participate, and the department is responsible for determining how much, if any, of the proceeds are gonna be shared with that uh, chapter. Since this event has you know, grown in recent years and has been uh, being conducted, I think this is the 13th year coming up for the Military Appreciation Monday, many departments have incorporated very specific language in their bylaws to cover Golden Corral to the point where it will specify that 50% of all funds raised at each of the stores will stay with the chapter that actually went out and did the legwork. The other 50% will come to the department because at the end of the day, it is a department fundraiser. It will also, uh, there, and it really covers the board. I mean, some, will, some departments will only receive 10%, leaving the other 90% to the chapter that went out and did all the legwork. Some departments, require all the money come to the, the department uh, and then make grants back to the chapters as needed. Some departments allow the chapters to keep everything. So if your department has not yet uh, solidified a policy in the department's bylaws, you might want to consider it because a number of the calls and the complaints that we get around that time of the year is the uh, dissatisfaction with how much the chapter is getting as a result of the Golden Corral fundraising program. And again, all of the information that is sent out in preparation for Military Appreciation Monday stipulates that this is a department fundraising program that is being conducted with the assistance of its local chapters. But at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the department to determine how much uh, will stay with the chapter that went out and did the legwork and how much will come to the department. Also, um, that last bullet point there, departments are responsible for selecting and identifying chapters that are gonna participate at the local restaurants in their state. And you know, this is another problem that we run into each and every year because you might have one golden corral in a city like um, St. Louis. Uh, and I'm just using that as an example, but there might be three chapters that are chartered in St. Louis, Missouri. So who goes out and who is responsible for that store? Uh, in most cases, it's a combined effort of uh, the, the three chapters getting together, going in, conducting the fundraiser, and then splitting the proceeds of the funds amongst them equally three ways. Uh, others, other chapters just simply do not want to participate in Golden Crown Military Appreciation Monday, so the department might uh, appoint another chapter that uh, is somewhat local to represent the department in collecting funds for that store. So again, it's really the department's discretion, and at the end of the day, it boils down to uh, what the DEC decides. So it might be wise, in addition to not only formulating something to include in your bylaws specific to how much money stays with the chapter, how much money comes back to the department, you might want to also uh, formulate and solidify plans as it relates to each store and who will participate. And if there's more than one uh, chapter in a Golden Corral's area, is it going to be a combined effort? Is it going to be an every other year uh, opportunity for each of the three chapters? That will alleviate any 
concerns, problems, uh, debates in the future because it's clearly outlined and noted in the department's bylaws. <laughs> bar lounge operations. Um, bar lounge operations are fundraisers. Um, and what's the definition of a fundraiser? An activity that is going to gen generate revenue to support service programs, in DAV's case, because we're a service organization. Um, so that first bullet point there may be authorized or may be allowed for the purpose of raising money in order to support service programs for the chapter. And I know that this is the case in most instances where there are chapters that have a bar lounge operation. Um, it, and it's not practice, but the chapter is supposed to get annual approval for that fundraising program. It's not a given that because you have a, a program right now and because you have operated your bar lounge operation for the last 20 years that you're going to be permitted to operate a bar lounge operation into the future because, again, it's a fundraiser. And if the program is not generating revenue to support DAV service programs, then there's no reason for the program to continue because, of course, NEC Regulation 4 and really common sense dictates that if you're not making money and you're losing money on a fundraiser, you shouldn't do it. You can't do it because now you're taking money that's otherwise dedicated and set aside for service programs to prop up and subsidize a losing fundraising program. Does that make sense? Um, so that's why NEC Regulation 4 is there to ensure that we have a method to enforce really common sense. If you're not making money, you shouldn't do it. Uh, but of course, that, of course, that's not uh, the case in many instances because people like having the bar. They like coming in and getting a 50 cent draft beer that costs, you know, 75 cents to pour. Uh, but at the end of the day, those operations are permitted to exist by the department as a fundraiser. But at the point where it no longer generates revenue to support service programs, the department certainly has the opportunity to say, no, we're not going to allow, and of course, by way of the department, I'm talking about the executive committee because no one person makes the decisions of the department. The executive committee could come back and say, you know, chapter uh, 73, You've lost money the last two years in this program. We're not going to permit the chapter to operate a fundraiser in the future until at such point you can um, submit another request for a fundraiser, but then identify how you're going to make this program profitable to the point where it's going to be beneficial to providing service programs of the chapter. Um, currently, there are um, 29 bar lounge operations as of this year, and that's uh, throughout the country. Uh, all the departments, all the chapters combined, we've only got 29 bar lounge operations. Of those 29, 14 of them are operating at a loss. And the reason I point that out is because those of you who are department leaders should be looking at the annual financial reports of all your chapters every year. And if you see a chapter that, you know, maybe this last year, uh, has lost money on their bar lounge operation, take a look back in the AFR, see how far that goes back. And it's very shocking when you add that up over a 10 year period, if they've been losing money for 10 years, how much money has been lost. In many cases, it's you know, $100,000, $200,000 that would have otherwise been sent on pro spent on service programs that have been going towards and supporting and subsidizing a losing fundraising operation. Um, so we've got 14 that are currently operating at a loss and uh, another 13 are making just enough to justify their existence. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing more infuriating because again, it's a fundraiser. It's not a, it's not a right because you own a building that you have a right to operate a bar lounge operation. The whole purpose of the bar lounge is a fundraiser, generate revenue to allow the chapter to operate service programs. Um, but quite often, we'll look at annual financial reports and see that 
a chapter had made, uh, just as an example, $100,000 of income from their bar lounge operation, but their expenses for that bar lounge operation over the year was $99,995. You made five bucks for a $100,000 operation. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But in accordance with our bylaws and our NEC regulations, they didn't lose any money, so therefore they can continue. But again, we just got to remember and, and, and understand that these aren't rights. This is not uh, something that should be offered to members just as a place to come and socialize and drink cheap beer. We got to be making money on these things so that we can turn around and provide service in the community. That's the whole purpose of a fundraiser. Um, so that next to the last bullet, uh, I think I talked about earlier, I mean, we continually monitor these things each and every year. And, you know, so that we know we've only got 29 and 14 of them are operating at a loss and, and 13 of them are making just enough to justify their existence. Department leaders, you need to be really looking at these each and every year because remember, as I said earlier, it's a fundraising program and we all know that chapter fundraising programs have to get the prior approval of the department. And those approvals, especially in a bar lounge or a bingo operation, should be on an annual basis because, of course, it's not something that we can do every month. You'll be sending out ballots uh, 12 times during the course of the year. So annually, uh, a chapter, if you've got a bar lounge or a bingo operation, you need to make the request of the department to get the approval to operate that fundraiser for the next year. And if you're losing money, and you know you're losing money, when you submit that request to the department asking for permission to conduct the fundraiser, you might want to take a very serious look at how you're conducting business, your drink prices, uh, things of that nature, to ensure that you're gonna get a favorable reply from the department by providing a plan of profitability. So acknowledging, hey, we, we've lost money the last two years, but we'd like to continue this operation in the coming year, and here's how we're going to make money moving forward. Everything from raising drink prices, you know, lowering the, the stock or the inventory, whatever the case might be. But if you're gonna operate a bar lounge, it's a, it's a business, so you've gotta make good business decisions to make it profitable. Bingo operations, um, same thing. It's a fundraiser, right? It's probably one of the most common fundraising programs for chapters that have buildings um, across the country. Same thing, you can't operate a fundraiser at a loss. NEC Regulation 4, which is common sense, uh, really the enforcer of the common sense rule that you, if you're operating a fundraiser, you can't lose money. Um, one of the most important things that chapters need to realize is that your chapter is responsible for uh, filing all the required local and state regulatory filings. So whether you need a permit, whether you need to file financial reports, whether you need to get training, certification for the chapter, and it, it, it really covers the gamut. Uh, every state is a little bit different as it relates to charitable gaming laws. So it's the chapter's responsibility to know those laws, understand them, and comply with them fully. Um, because at the end of the day, we have had chapters that just decided they were going to do fundraising and conduct bingo, come to find out they were in violation. The gaming commission of the, of the state finds out about it and then hits them with a $100,000 fine that they can't pay. So, you know, the chapter ends up going bankrupt, closes the doors, that's the end of DAV. So prior to operating any fundraising uh, program, it's incumbent upon the chapter and the department to understand what the local laws are in their county and in their state and make sure that they comply with those laws as well. <clears throat> Thrift stores. Um, we have a handful of uh, departments that operate thrift stores as a program to generate revenue for their service programs. Uh, in 1989, the National Convention in 1989 voted to amend the bylaws to no longer allow chapters to operate thrift stores. Quite frankly, it's just a, it, it, it's a business. It's a huge business. And in many cases, chapters were finding themselves 
uh, involved in operating thrift stores got in way over their head, uh, were going bankrupt, and it just was not a good business practice for chapters. However, any chapter that had a thrift store operation prior to 1989 was permitted to keep it, and they were grandfathered in. Um, departments that are currently operating thrift stores, you know, it really, really varies. There are, there are some that are very, very successful, and there are others that, you know, barely can make enough money to justify their existence. And again, uh, it's a fundraiser. It should be generating revenue. And when you find yourself um, in a position and at that point where you're spending more money to keep the doors open than what you're bringing in, you got to make that hard uh, decision to close it, revamp it, um, you know, figure out what you're going to do to turn around and make it profitable again. Financial reports at all levels, every entity, whether it be a DAV chapter, a department, the national organization, the DAV auxiliary unit, state department of the auxiliary, national entity of the auxiliary, NOTR, we all have to provide financial reports. Um, our, as we all know, our accounting year for finances is uh, the same as our membership year, July 1st through June 30th of the following year. We ask and the bylaws require that financial reports be submitted within 90 days at the uh, close of the uh, finance year. So by September 30th, if you're a chapter, you owe a, your department an annual finan financial report. Um, all departments are responsible for providing financial reports to the national organization. Um, any chapter that has more than $10,000 of income during the course of the fiscal year, not only do you have to provide a financial report to the department, but also to the national organization. And the reason for that is because being a nonprofit organization, we're governed by the Internal Revenue Service. And as a national organization, we're responsible for ensuring that all of our subordinate entities, whether it's the department, whether it's the DAB, Auxiliary National Organization, NOTR, chapters, units, whatever, uh, are in compliance with IRS regulations. Uh, so in other words, if something happens to a chapter or something happens to a department, then of course we're on the hook for it ultimately. So we, the reason that we ask for and receive those annual financial reports is just for that very reason. We can see what the chapter is doing in terms of generating funds, what the funds are being spent for, and of course we all know that we're obligated by way of our charter to uh, fund service programs. So. That's when we have a chapter or a department that's not uh, fulfilling that obligation, we certainly talk to them and remind them that uh, of our purpose, what we're supposed to be spending money on, uh, so that we can all stay out of trouble. But uh, that's the whole purpose and the intent of an annual financial report. It's just oversight, making, you know, holding people accountable, keeping everybody honest, but most importantly, ensuring that they're in compliance with uh, our charter in providing service programs. If we have entity, any entity in DAV, uh, any chapter, any department that has over $300,000 of income, excluding the dues distributions that are provided by national, um, those require a CPA review. Basically, it's just checks and balances. Uh, a few years ago, that used to read a CPA audit, which in many cases became very, very, very expensive to the unit having to comply with that uh, uh, request. Um, when it was changed a few years ago to a CPA review, that lessened the burden and lessened the financial expense of the department of the chapter uh, pretty significantly, but yet a CPA review provides many of the same indicators as a CPA review that would alert us to any kind of impropriety uh, within that entity. Um, departments, as I mentioned earlier, um, all chapters have to provide a financial report to the department. All chapters have to provide a financial report to the national organization if they had over $10,000 income. Departments, it's your responsibility 
as department leaders to not only receive and then file those annual finance reports away, but look at them. Look at what the chapter's doing. Look at uh, um, their income. Look at their expenses. Because we want to ensure that we're spending money as per the wants, wishes of our donors. Um, I can tell you that there's absolutely uh, nothing that infuriates me and many others more than when we see the hard work of a chapter being thrown out the window because we've turned around and made a sizable donation to another nonprofit organization. You know, uh, and it, it's, it's really, it, it baffles me. We ask for money from the general public under our name, under our tax exemption as an organization, DAV. People know who we are. They give us money with the expectation that that donation is going to be spent on DAV service programs. For the DAV entity to turn around and make a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar donation to another nonprofit organization, not only unethical in violation of IRS laws, but you've just upset a donor base that gave DAV money with the expectation the money was going to go to service programs because you gave it to another nonprofit. If the donor wanted their money to go to Wounded Warrior Project or any other group, they would have given that donation directly to them. But we accepted their donation. We gave them a tax receipt for their tax purposes. We can't turn around and give it to another organization. And believe it or not, we see that more than I care to admit. And some of them are just outright donations. We're going to give you, you know, $25,000. That's money that we could have put in a van to operate a DAV program. As we all know, many of us are dual members in other organizations, whether it be the Legion, whether it be the VFW, AMVETS, you name it. Many of our chapters meet in American Legion posts, VFW posts. When we go to a DAV meeting, we should have our DAV hat on only. We can't be thinking about planning for, asking for money in the interest of another organization. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, we've had instances where an American Legion post was losing money, you know, the roof was failing, they needed a new roof, needed $10,000. Well, the bar wasn't doing so well. They weren't bringing in as much revenue. So I get the bright idea as a member of the American Legion, as the commander of the American Legion, hey, I'm also a member of DAV chapter that meets here. Next meeting, I'm going to go. I'm going to propose a resolution that DAV gives American Legion $10,000 so we can put a new roof on. You know, that, that's a conflict. That's not in the best interest of DAV. When we go to a DAV meeting, if we're not proposing, remember I talked about the mission statement earlier, providing service programs to DAV members and their families, didn't mention anything about coming in and discussing how we're going to help other organizations fulfill their obligation. Um, but we see that all the time, and that's just so very infuriating because I know that uh, I'm going to go in as a DAV member, I'm going to throw this uh, resolution or this proposal out to make a donation to the American Legion post for $10,000. Joe, my buddy here, he's the treasurer in American Legion. I know he's going to support it. Ralph, he's the, uh, the adjutant for the post. He'll support it. And guess what? There are only four of us here, so we're going to go ahead and pass this thing. We got to, again, we raise money in DAV's name. We have to spend money in DAV's name. Financial accountability. I'm going to spend a good deal of time on this uh, here because this last year has not been a good year for many DAV chapters and a few departments. And when I say didn't have a good year, I'm not talking about wasn't successful in providing service programs, uh, weren't successful in generating revenue, but had problems with sticky fingers. And I can tell you, 
we've got no time, no place in DAV for money to be embezzled, stolen, borrowed, loaned to members. Um, unfortunately, this last year we had some folks that went to jail because we identified theft and most members think, well, you know, if I get caught, I'll be Article 16 and I'll no longer be a member of DAV. Well, those days are gone. Depending upon the circumstances, obviously, if we find theft, not only will we be Article 16 and thrown out of DAV, but that individual will also be referred to the prosecutor's office along with a nice outline of what we've identified and you go before a grand jury and are indicted and are arrested, thrown in jail and charged with embezzlement. Um, and I hate to say that because we're all, we're all veterans. We all have the best interests of DAV at heart. But there are some, for whatever reason or another, feel that DAV's money is my money. I'm a disabled veteran. Why can't it help me? And when we ask those folks, why'd you do it? That's usually the reason. Well, you know, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I'm a disabled vet, you know. I, you know, the chapter didn't approve it. You were the treasurer, you just took it. That's not the way that, that we do business. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the chapter decides everything in DAV. What we spend money on, what programs we support, uh, where we're going to order pizza from for the chapter meeting, everything. So how do we prevent that from happen, happening? First way is our monthly financial reports. How many of you go to your chapter meeting every month but do not get a piece of paper in the form of an annual or a monthly financial report with a copy of the bank statement? How many don't get that when you go to your chapter meetings? I'm sure, I'm sure there's many more than that. What we need, what we ask, what we demand is that DAV members hold their officers accountable. So if you run for and are elected or appointed chapter treasurer, you have an obligation. We talked about them earlier. One of those ob obligations is to provide a uh, monthly financial report at every meeting. The days of the treasurer standing up and saying, well, we have 50000 in the bank, we spent 10000 we have a balance of 40000 All in favor? Aye. We can't do that. You ever heard the old saying, trust but verify? And again, we, we're all members. We all want to do the right thing, and we all hope and we all believe that everybody's going to do the right thing for DAV. But unfortunately, we have a few bad apples that are in it for reasons other than the best interest of DAV. So demand those financial reports. When you go to your chapter meeting, if you don't have a bank statement, and if you've got CDs, copies of the CD statements, um, show me the money. Don't tell me what we have, show me. I want to see it. So make it a point to get in the habit of demanding bank statements with those monthly financial reports. Same thing at the department level. When you go to a finance committee meeting, not only should you have a spreadsheet showing your budget, where you are in the budget, how much is left, also have copies of those bank statements. Because it's one thing to put numbers into a spreadsheet to show what we have, where we have it, but show us the bank statements. We want to see that the balance of this bank statement equals the ending balance over here on your spreadsheet because I can put numbers in a spreadsheet all day long and make it look like we've got a million bucks when we've got 10 bucks in the bank and you know we have an overdraft uh, uh, charge coming our way. And that's happened, where an individual has just drained the chapter dry. Chapter believed you know, we had $30,000 in the bank. We're gonna, we're gonna order a new van this year. Well, I'm looking at the financial reports and you look at the minutes, the, the treasurer said we had $30,000 in the bank. Well, guess what? When it comes time to order the van, the treasurer's gone, and the chapter says, well, we should probably have somebody go over there and get their name on the signature card. Come to find out, well, sir, we're glad you came in because your account's overdrawn. Can you give us 10 bucks? Can you give us 20 bucks because you guys are overdrawn? You know, talk about shock. 
So show me the money. Trust, but verify. Um, the second bullet point there, when we're dealing with finances of the chapter and expenditures, every chapter's bylaws, every department's bylaws has a clause in expenses and finances that stipulates that two, at least two signatures will be on every check. Every check has two signatures. That means that two people agreed to the payee, two people agreed to the amount, two people agreed to the purpose for what it was signed for, and then the signatures go on. Can you put two signatures on a credit card or a debit card? No, you can go in, you can charge whatever you want with one signature. If you've got a, a debit card and you've got the PIN number, you can go and take out whatever you want whenever you want. And again, that's happened. And it seems like it's easier to do business with credit cards and debit cards because of the age we live in. But if you stop and think about all we do as an organization in providing service, we go to conventions, we go to seminars, as members of DAV, do we really have to have a debit card or a credit card? No. Everything that we do can be done by way of a check. And if you have a credit card or a debit card, you're allowing one individual the opportunity to take every nickel out of that account and not find it for at least 30 days or longer. And it defeats the two signature rule on all checks because now you got one person that has unilateral ability to take money out of the accounts. It's, is it easier to have a debit card and a credit card when you're doing business? Yeah, maybe a little bit. But if you think about all of the events and activities that we're involved in, going to department convention. Um, if I'm going to department convention and I'm a delegate of my chapter and the chapter's paying me to go, um, I can either put it on my own credit card, and when I get back, I fill out a voucher with receipts showing my expenses. This is how much my room was. This is how much my meals were. This was my how many miles I drove. This is how much the chapter owes me, as they are already agreed to. Fill out that voucher, submit the receipts, get your reimbursement, pay your credit card at the end of the month. If you're not able to do that, there's nothing wrong with getting an advance from the chapter. If you're a delegate of your chapter and you're going to the department convention, you know that it might cost, uh, you know you know what the rooms are gonna cost. You can expect what you're gonna pay for meals. You can estimate your mileage. If you know that it's gonna cost about $500 to go to the department convention, you're a delegate. The chapter's already voted to approve your expenses. There's nothing wrong with getting an advance of $500 so that you can go, pay your bills, go to the convention, participate. But when you get back, you do the exact same thing. You complete a voucher, provide all the receipts that justify those expenses that you had while conducting DAV chapter business. And if there's a little left over based upon the receipts, you write a check back to the chapter for the remaining $26.75. If the chapter owes you a little bit more, then as long as the vouchers are completed and the receipts justify it, the chapter has the ability to reimburse you for the additional $27 that you spent in addition to the initial $500 they gave you. Um, so I, I don't want to harp on debit cards, credit cards too much. Oh, and another thing, gift cards. People are getting pretty creative. And, and I, I'm just using vague examples, but examples that are very real and have occurred. Um, gift cards, how, how harmless is a gift card, you know? Good example, Chapter has a very large homeless veterans community. <coughs> Excuse me. Or it's coming up on holiday time, it's coming up on Thanksgiving, Christmas. The Chapter wants to do something for veterans in the area. So the Chapter decides, well, we want to um, purchase gift cards to give to homeless veterans so they can buy food, they can buy uh, clothes, blankets, whatever the case might be. 
and the chapter goes out, buys $1,000, buys 10 $100 gift cards for Walmart. Sounds great. Chapter feels good because we bought these gift cards. They're going to benefit disabled veterans at holiday time. Now someone's got to be in charge of them. Someone's responsible for administering them. We've had instances where chapter commander, oh, I'll take care of that, or someone says, I'll take care of it, and there's no oversight. Come back to the next chapter meeting, commander says, yeah, you know, I found four guys underneath the bridge, I found two guys at Hardee's, they needed some help, so I handed them out to them. How do I know that? How do I know that you just didn't pocket the 10 $100 gift cards and you purchased you know, groceries and things you need for the next month. How do we, the only way that we're able to under, overcome that is to make sure that the people come to us. So if there's a, a, a need for a veteran, um, they need to come to the chapter. They need to come to our next chapter meeting so that we can see and we can give them directly the, the, the assistance that they need. So handing out gift cards to people, not a good idea. Handing cash to people, not a good idea, obviously. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're continuing to serve veterans and their families. And if we have the ability to provide some form of relief financially to them, then by all means, that's a service that we can provide. But we need to document. Show us your electricity is getting ready to be turned off. It's dead of winter. We can't have that happen. Bring us your utility bill. We'll write a check to the utility company with your account number on it, and we'll gladly pay your utility bill. But we shouldn't have and facilitate making general donations, or cash donations, rather, based upon a perceived need. We can't make a check out to the individual the same example, a veteran comes to us, lights about ready to be turned out, dead of winter. He's shown us that here's the bill, shut off notice tomorrow. Should we just write the check payable to the veteran in that amount? Absolutely not, because he can go cash that, use it for whatever he wants. Um, you came to us in need of paying that electric bill. We voted to pay your electric bill. We're not going to write a check to you to go cash and do with as you please. But if we write it out to the utility company, put the veteran's name, the account number on there, we know that that check can only be negotiated by that utility company for that one purpose. Properly completed checks before signatures. Many times, and, and this gets folks in trouble also, and it's under the umbrella of, well, it was more convenient. Well, when we're dealing with DAV finances, we need to protect them as we would our own. I would never write out a check, a blank check, put my signature on it, and leave it down there overnight, and hope that it's still there in the morning. Because anybody can come along, fill out the payee, fill out the amount, it's got my signature on it, they can go cash it for whatever they want. That's the same thing with DAV, we cannot pre-sign blank checks just because it's convenient. If you have a need to have, and we all have to have two signatures on a, on a check, and your treasurer lives on the other side of the state, you've got to make some kind of arrangement either by mail or require that the, the treasurer come to the department every month to sign checks. Um, but we can't pre-sign them in hopes that they're going to be filled out completely by one individual. Uh, we've had instances of, of that where money's walked away, money's been made payable to one of the signees. You know, I'm authorized to sign a check, so my name's on there. The other officer's name was on there. It's a blank check. I'm pay to Ed Hartman, however much. Again, we've just got to we've got to treat DAV funds like they're our own. We have to be protective of DAV funds like they're our own. 
Vouchers for expenditures, I, I mentioned that a little bit uh, briefly. No funds should go out by a chapter or department unless there is a voucher that supports that payment. Because of course, at the end of the day, the commander doesn't have the authority to grant approval for an expense. The treasurer doesn't have the unilateral authority to grant expense. The body does. So when the body gets a voucher for a claimed reimbursement to the chap or to the member for X amount of dollars, here's the receipts, eh, match up, okay, pay it. So if you don't have a voucher system in place at the chapter level or the department level, you need to adopt one because it's a good record to have when someone from the department or someone from the national organization comes and says, what, would the, what was this what was this payment or what was this check made payable to you in the amount of $1,000 for? We got to have some, well, oh, that was for a spring conference right here. I paid $700 for the hotel. Here were the meals. Here was the gas. Done and over. Um, we have to take better control and better care of uh, our assets. So vouchers, if you don't have them, implement one. Uh, I got a little ahead of myself or a little earlier. I'm talking about veterans uh, assistance vouchers, checks, not cash, obviously. Make the checks payable to the service for which they're asking help for. You know, if they come in and say, you know, my car just died, it's going to cost me $1,000 to put a new transmission in, can the chapter help me? Absolutely. You know, if the chapter agrees, um, go have your work done, and when the bill comes, bring it to us, we'll write the, the, the check out for $1,000 to Joe's Auto Body or wherever they're having the service done, but don't make it out payable to them. It's unfortunate, but we have a lot of people who, and not, not DAV members, but professional veterans that go organization to organization to organization asking for money for the same thing, and uh, they make it their habit. They move from community to community doing just that and they do quite well, unfortunately. Um, when we do fundraisers, forget-me-nots, we should always have two members counting money because we've had instances again where an individual goes out, does forget-me-not drives, has a big bucket full of money at the end of the day, but that bucket shrunk to about that big whenever they turned it into the chapter the next day. So accountability, making sure that there are controls in place to ensure that there's no opportunity for money to walk away. And at the end of the day, use common sense. You know, if you wouldn't make this payment, if you wouldn't recommend this payment, you wouldn't spend your money for something, don't spend DAB's money on it. Make sure that you have those safeguards in place. All right, I'm gonna get off, I'm gonna get off that. It's been a bad year, but I, I wanted to spend a lot of time on that today. And we've only got about 15 minutes, so I want to leave a little time for uh, Q&A. Internal Revenue Service, everybody's favorite arm of the federal government. Um, we all know that every entity, every chapter, every department, every auxiliary has to file some form of a 990 with the Internal Revenue Service every year. The rule of, uh, the rule of thumb is if your chapter or department brought in less than $50,000 in the year, all you do is the very simple electronic form 990N. If your entity made over $50,000 in the course of the year, you got to complete a more difficult 990 or 990EZ. Uh, the filing deadline for all of our submittals of 990s uh, in DAV's name is prior to, I shouldn't say prior to, not earlier than July 1st, but not later than November 15th. That's the window for everybody to file their 990s. Um, Obviously, we all know that if you don't file a 990 for three consecutive years, the IRS is going to revoke your tax exemption. That means that if you are no longer a tax exempt entity, you can't raise money in DAV's name. If you can't raise money in DAV's name, you can't spend money in DAV's name. And then eventually, if you don't get it fixed, at some point, um, the tough call to revoke the charter of the entity is, is necessary. So very important that we comply we fill out those 990s, keep the Internal Revenue Service happy, 
and um, we're able to continue doing what we do. The only information that you need to complete a 990 in, there's no paper form for it, it's all done online, it's an electronic version, is the employee or employer identification number that's issued by the IRS to the chapter, to the department. Many of you know that if you get correspondence now from the national organization, uh, the chapter level or the department level, every piece of correspondence that is specific to your chapter now includes that EIN. The reason that we've done that is because uh, it's a lot of times new officers don't uh, hand over all the records, all the files. You might not know what your EIN number is. So when you got that, that's your EIN specific to your group. That's what you'd use to file your 990 with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, so all you need is the EIN, legal name of the, the commander or whomever is authorized to receive the mail, and an address. That's it. Very, very simple. It takes less than 30 seconds. And I know many departments offer to provide that service uh, for all of the chapters in the departments just to ensure that they get it done and it's done correctly. Things that will keep us out of the trouble, out of trouble during the coming year. Make sure you file your officer reports. We all know that uh, every time we have an election, officer reports are due to the national organization, to the department, 10 days after the election. Make sure you file your financial reports timely, file your IRS forms, safeguard DAV assets and lists. When I talk about lists, I'm talking about our membership lists. Um, We've had some chapters, large chapters, with several thousand members um, that are approached by professional solicitors in the community. They're in the business of, of mailing uh, advertisements for different companies, and you know they look for lists all the time. We should not make DAV's list available to anyone outside of DAV for any reason. Uh, last thing we want to do is, is uh, burden our members with now all of a sudden getting solicitations and advertisements from, you know, everybody under the sun. So in addition to safeguarding DAV assets, safeguard DAV lists as well. Uh, get the appropriate fund uh, approvals for all of your fundraisers. Um, and it's, it's something that I've, I've said a couple times today, integrity, make sure that we always do what's right, even when no one's looking. We all... We all have that deep down, and we all trust that those around us, other members, other officers, have that very high degree of integrity as well. But, as I said earlier, trust but verify in everything we do. Many times when uh, we identify a theft to a chapter, you know what the number one response is that I typically get? Is, man, I can't believe it, I trusted him. Well, did you verify what he was telling you? No, I trusted him. I've known him for 20 years. You'd be surprised. So um, let's really try to drill down and tighten up in you know, making sure that what people tell us are accurate. Not questioning anyone's integrity, but verify. So what will happen if we don't do any of these things as a chapter or department? Obviously, uh, you know, the bylaws are the bylaws for a reason. They apply to all of us. They apply to the national organization, departments, and chapters. And if a chapter or department isn't able to comply with the bylaws, everybody applies by certain rules. Uh, if you're not able to do that, the first step is the suspension of the charter. That means that nothing can be done. You've got to fix the deficiencies and then get the charter back or have the suspension lift so that you can move forward. If after suspensions don't work, still get no compliance, unfortunately, at that point, the national commander has the, um, the opportunity and the ability to just revoke the charter of the chapter. Nobody wants to see that happen. You know, we, we have chapters for a reason. We provide service to veterans and communities. But sometimes having no DAV chapter, in some cases, is better than having a DAV chapter that is just absolutely... Uh, rogue, doesn't follow the rules, is problematic. Um, so, and again, nobody wants to revoke the charter of the chapter, but sometimes it's necessary for various reasons.